I like this story I read this week because when I was a boy, I was afraid of the dark. It's a story about a little boy who was scared of the dark and he was scared of storms. So one night, his mommy and daddy put him to bed and tucked him in and he already didn't like to be there just because he was afraid of the dark. And then a storm started rolling in. The lightning, the thunder, and mommy and daddy had gone to bed and all of a sudden there was coming down the hallway, the sound of feet running down the hallway and the little boy appears in his mommy and daddy's bedroom and says, I'm scared, can I sleep with you? Most of you mother and fathers know what I'm talking about, right? <clears throat> Most of you children won't admit it. And his, his father and mother had made a commitment that they didn't really want to start this habit of sleeping with them. So father got out of bed and took the little boy back to his bedroom and said, it'll be okay. Just remember that Jesus is with you. He's protecting you and watching over you. And so father prayed a little prayer for the boy, went back to his bedroom, tucked the little boy in, went back to his bedroom. And then a flash of lightning and a crash of thunder. And the little boy, mommy, daddy. To which daddy replied, you're okay. Who's watching over you? Of course, the little boy has to say, Jesus, you'll be okay. The little boy replied, yeah, I know Jesus is protecting me, but sometimes I like to have someone with skin on. It seems to me that that describes what God did when he gave us Jesus as a baby. He gave us someone with skin on. It's part of the Christmas story. We just read it. I just want to read it one more time for you. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, it says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, Joseph, in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, it is entirely possible that we have read this passage so many times. We have heard Emmanuel, God with us, so many times that when we read this passage, we don't get it. We don't get the wow. This is a wow passage. Why in the world... Does God care about us? God cares about us so much that he sent Jesus to be God with us. That's a wow. Why did he care that much? Well, it's because he loves us so very much. This is a comforting thought. It's a beautiful idea that Jesus became the God with us. Jesus was God with skin on. This, his coming was the beginning of the culmination. Now, that's a strange way to put it, but you'll see why later. His coming as a baby was the beginning of the culmination of the plan of redemption. It was, in theological terms, a strange plan called the Incarnation. That means God became flesh. I call it the infleshization of God. And it's a marvelous and mysterious plan. And scripture tells us that God the Father 
Jesus and the Holy Spirit in heaven hatched this plan in heaven, even before they knew they would need it, even before Adam and Eve sinned, there was this plan because God loves us that much. Now, this whole idea of God with us, it's an amazing thought. God is the almighty, the powerful one of the universe. We are nothing. The song Amazing Grace, the original words, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When it was first written, the song said, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a worm like me. But some people were offended by, the t- by being called a worm. Get over it. A worm like me. How amazing that God, the most powerful being in this universe, wants to spend time with you. Some of you are hard to spend time with. But God wants to spend time with you. But this wasn't just something he thunk up at the last minute when Jesus came to this earth. It was God's plan from the very beginning. God, from the very beginning of the creation of this world, wanted to spend time with you. That's why he created the Sabbath. In creation week, he created man the sixth day. On the seventh day, he created the Sabbath. The purpose of the Sabbath was so Adam and Eve and God would have time to spend together to get to know each other better. It was a special day. Now, as we'll see in just a second, it seems like Adam and Eve got to walk and talk with God other times other than just Sabbath. And so God could see that a perfect man and a perfect woman and a perfect world still needed a Sabbath to get to know him. How much more does not do imperfect people like you and me in an imperfect world like this need a day to spend time with a perfect God so we get to know him better? So God's very purpose in the beginning with creating the Sabbath was so he could be with us. So the Sabbath was the first God with us. So God created this day because he wanted to... He wanted to love Adam and Eve, and he wanted them to love him more. And then, further in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we see another God with us. Genesis 3, verse 8. Genesis 3 is a chapter of the fall of man. Genesis 3, verse 8. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the evening, And the man and the woman hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. Adam and Eve had sinned, and so God came down and walked with them. It seems like it was a regular occurrence. God came down in the cool of the evening to walk with them, and they hid themselves from him, which was an unusual thing. It seems as though other times they had been able to walk and talk with God face to face, but this time they hid themselves. They couldn't stand in the presence of God because they had sinned. So they hid themselves. God wanted to be with them, but God had to withdraw himself from them. Isaiah 59.2 says, our iniquities caused a separation between us and God. I don't want you to think that God was just so ticked off at Adam and Eve that they had sinned. He was so ticked off that he said, out of here. We're done with you. No. God had to withdraw from Adam and Eve for their protection. Because God was perfect and they were now imperfect. They were sinful. And sinfulness cannot stand in the sight of perfection. I think that's actually what happens at the very end when people and the sinners are destroyed in the fires of hell. What happens is God, God allows his purity to overwhelm mankind, sinful, evil mankind. And so they're destroyed by his brightness. And that would have happened to Adam and Eve had God not protected them and separated himself from them. So even though he hated to, he separated himself. It was no longer God with them. And yet they did have this continual reminder of God with them in the sacrificial system that he set up. Reminding them of the sacrifice of God with them. If you look through the Old Testament, you'll find Character after character that spent time with God and learned to know God. Spent time in the presence of God. Abraham, Joseph, David. These great men of faith. Mostly of faith, although they did have their times too, right? 
One of my favorites of the Old Testament, it shows the presence of God is, is Enoch. And it says, Enoch walked with God and he was no more. I heard someone describe this text one time. I loved it. It said, Enoch walked so much with God that one day God looked at Enoch and said, hey, we're closer to my house than we are yours. Let's go to my house. So Enoch, took, Enoch was taken to heaven. I like that. Enoch was with God. God wanted to be with Enoch, and now he's been there for a long time. Over and over again, God is with his people. It's his purpose to be with his people. In the book of Exodus, God instituted a way to be with his people that lasted over 800 years. The book of Exodus chapter 25, we're told, Exodus 25 verse 8, we're told the purpose of the sanctuary in the Old Testament. Exodus 25, 8, God gave these specific directions about how the sanctuary was to be made. But the purpose of the sanctuary, it says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. The purpose of the sanctuary was God with us, just like Jesus. Only this was a shadow of Jesus. The purpose of the sanctuary was so God could be with his people. And after the sanctuary was built and everything was done, something incredible marvelous happens in Exodus chapter 40 starting with verse 34 after everything was ready it says verse 34 then the cloud covered the temp- the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of the house of Israel through all their journeys. God was with them, and they could not only... They could know it by his physical presence, by by their eyes. They could see God with them. In the, in the cloud and in the fire. God with us. Later on, it became a permanent setting when Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. And the, the glory of the Lord, according to Second Chronicles 5, 13 and 14, again, the glory of the Lord came onto that, into that temple and God blessed them. God was with his people. They knew it. But you know, the sad story is that because of idolatry, God withdrew his presence. In the time of Zedekiah, the king and his successors, Israel fell into into idolatry. And God, in preparation for Nebuchadnezzar to come and destroy the temple in 586 BC, God had to withdraw his presence, his glory. God was no longer with them. They were taken into Babylonian captivity. And there they they mourned that God was not with them. And then God gives them this vision in Ezekiel 10. This vision in Ezekiel 10, it's a weird vision. It it was sung in a a quartet number, something like this. Ezekiel saw a wheel way up high in the middle of the air. You know this song? You know the story? Ezekiel gets this vision and it's, it's wheels and it's angels and it's... Uh, it's an amazing vision, wheels and wheels. And you might have think he had too much pizza before he went to bed. I don't know. But, but what's the meaning of the vision? Well, the meaning of the vision is Ezekiel sees God's throne with wheels. And this is a new idea. God's throne is movable. God is not just a God back there in Judah, but God is, you know, have wheels, will travel type of God. His throne is movable. And this Ezekiel vision is trying to tell the people of, who are in captivity in Babylon that God is not just back there. God is here. God assured them of his presence. Even though his presence had been withdrawn from the temple, God, even in Babylonian captivity, with this strange vision, assures them that God is with them. When they came back from Babylonian captivity, they built another temple, and there's only one way to describe it. P. 
pitiful. The old man who had come back and saw the one that was being built in comparison to the one that Solomon had built, all they did was hang their heads and cry. It was pitiful. God never came in his Shekinah glory to this temple like he did to the sanctuary and to Solomon's temple. But something exciting happened in this temple. This is when Jesus came into flesh to this temple. God with us. God's plan was always to be with his people. God with us. John chapter 14, uh, John chapter 1 verse 14 has an interesting um, text talking about this. John chapter 1 verse 14. You know, John doesn't have a nativity story. This is as close to a nativity story or a birth story as John gets. John chapter 1 verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now it's interesting that word for dwelt in Greek is a very interesting word. The word is skenao, which literally means a temple or a tabernacle or a sanctuary. Some translations translate this verse, the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. You see, the, the promises that God had been foreshadowing in the Old Testament sanctuary and in the temple were actually embodied in Jesus, the real God with us. God's plan has always been that he wanted to be with his people. Even after Jesus ascended and went back to heaven, he didn't leave us alone. He didn't leave us orphans. John chapter 14 tells us where we are right now. In this age in which we live, God is still with his people. John chapter 14, starting with verse 16. Jesus is speaking to the disciples on the very night in which he is betrayed. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you. Underline that. Some translations say an advocate or a counselor. He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you with you and will be in you the Holy Spirit I'm sorry verse 18 you got to read it too I will not leave you as orphans I will come to you God with us today with his Holy Spirit you know we are not left hopeless and alone we are not orphans we have a father in heaven And he is here right now in our midst through the Holy Spirit. God is still with us. You remember I said that the coming of Jesus was just the beginning of the culmination. Because there's even more to come. There's still the end of the story. Through his coming as a baby, he came to this earth But scripture says there will be another God with us moment. First Thessalonians, well, actually, let's look at John 14. We're still there. John 14, one through three says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. God wants to spend eternity with you. God with us for eternity. That is an amazing idea. First Thessalonians 4, Paul talks about the same thing. First Thessalonians 4. 
verses 16 through, through 17. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. This is a wow moment, folks. God wants to spend eternity with you. Because even though we may be worms, he loved us enough that he gave his son for our lives. He wants to spend eternity with you. Revelation chapter 21. Didn't know you could go from Genesis to Revelation in 25 minutes, did you? Revelation 21, starting with verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. You know, we could say that this is not the ultimate God with us moment. This is the ultimate us with God moment. Because it's no longer him coming to us. It's him taking us to be with him. Us with God. It has always been God's plan. Wow. Why in the world would God do that? Because of his love. I was trying to think today, for, for today, of, of adjectives that describe the, the love of God. So, here's a good adjective, good. The love of God is good. Right? The only way you can describe the love of God is with a superlative. A superlative adjective, which means it's the biggest adjective, adjective, adjective you can think of. Superlatives. I tried to think of adjectives to describe the love of God. Unbelievable. Is that a good one? Unfathomable. Undeserved. Unspeakable. Forgiving, incredible, fantastic, unexplainable, amazing, miraculous, immeasurable, unlimited, free, boundless, surpassing, transcending, everlasting, inseparable, indescribable. There's a popular Christian song right now. At least it was popular last time I heard it, maybe five or six years old, who knows. Indescribable, uncontainable, all powerful, untamable, perfect, self sacrifice, exhilarating, embracing, yearning. Can you add any more? <laughs> yes. What's that? Yeah, there we go. There we go. All of these adjectives des- describe how much God loves you. And if he didn't love you that much, he wouldn't want to spend eternity with you. But he does want to spend eternity with you. Which describes how much he loves you. We're going to sing, just as we close, number 143, Silent Night. We're going to sing just the first and last verses, number 143, the hymn I always like to end 
Christmas with. I always feel like when, um, when we sung this song, the, Christmas, the Sabbath after Christmas, Christmas is actually over. 